ago, we were talking last time about, um, well, last time we took a test, but the, the last time we were talking about math, uh, we were talking about um, uh, scalar line integrals. And uh, keep in mind, the big idea of scalar line integrals is really not that big of a deal. It's chop it up, add it up. It's just chop it up, add it up in the context of a different kind of a domain where, where the domain itself is one dimensional, namely a curve, but it lives in a world that is uh, two or possibly even three dimensional. Right. And so you just can't use the old formulas uh, that, you know, our previous formula for Riemann sum uh, for single variable does not fit. Dub, uh, double integral does not fit, et cetera. Um, so, so we have to write down um, a new formula for Riemann sum, but the big takeaway here, I cannot emphasize enough, chop it up, add it up is really all we're talking about here. So um, uh, good to know the notation, good to see how the notation is motivated by the Riemann sum that you're actually uh, uh, representing. Okay. Uh, but we can mostly move on to the question of, okay, well, yeah, but then how do I actually compute this? And remember now, that's a problem that we've had before, right? It's one thing to write down a Riemann sum, but how do you actually, yeah, but I need to get answers, right? Uh, how do you uh, do that? So the, the motivation, again, very similar to our motivation for change of variables. Change of variables says if you have a domain that you don't like, maybe because it has corners, maybe because it's bumpy and wiggly, whatever. But if you have a, a domain that you don't like, Find a way to view it as an image, then do a pullback. And don't forget you're gonna to have to have some sort of a stretching factor in order to recognize the fact that the new domain and the old domain are different and the sizes aren't the same. You've got to account for, you've got to account for that. So uh, we can take, generally speaking, that same strategy here. Here, our domain, I don't like it. Different reasons. It's not because of corners. It's not because it's bumpy and wiggly, particularly. Um, it's because it's dimensionally uh, uh, messed up, right? It's a one-dimensional thing in a two-dimensional world. Now, I, I don't have to deal with that. Um, so view it as an image. And uh, we can view it as an image, namely, by just parameterizing it. So pre-existing notion of a... Uh, of a, uh, you know, what's gonna effectively kind of play the role of kind of kind of playing the role of a change of variables function. Okay, all right. Um, so then a couple of details to crank out. I mean, what is the, what's the relationship between the size of a piece of curve uh, versus the size of the piece of the T axis that made it? Well, the relationship of course, is speed. I mean, if, so effectively what this says is distance is equal to what times time, right? And so speed uh, is our stretching factor. How are we doing? Is this uh, all ringing bells? Everybody comfortable with all this? Okay. Okay. So uh, we saw an example of this last time. Actually, we saw a bunch of examples. Um, I uh, uh, described a wire that follows a uh, particular curve that's parameterized by a given formula and uh, uh, claim density is distributed, you know, in the sense of mass per unit length uh, on this wire is uh, given by a certain formula, function of X and Y. And let's compute a bunch of stuff, the mass, the center of mass, the moment of inertia. And, I'm gonna do all of, these, all of these calculations at the same time because they're most of the calculation, most of the effort that goes into doing this uh, retains to the curve. And the questions that we're asking here are all about the same curve with the same density. So um, <clears throat> they're separate calculations, sure, but uh, I do think it's uh, convenient to write them down all at once. And just a quick reminder, again, we did all the details last time, but uh, the generic formula for mass, the generic formula for the coordinates of the centroid, center of mass, uh, the generic formula for the uh, moment of inertia, those are familiar. That's the same, same basic idea. You know, mass is the sum of a bunch of little pieces of mass, just like it's always been. 
Um, and then we just recognize that uh, it's the same curve and generally the same objects that we're dealing with. So how big is a piece of that curve? Excuse me, how much mass is there in a piece of curve? Density times ds for all of them. Um, what is the uh, ds? Well, it's x prime dt for all of them. Um, what is the density here? Oh, well, that's given. The density is x plus y. Whoops. Density x plus y for all of them. And so what it comes down to then uh, is the, uh, the, the difference in the specifics of, uh, oh, sorry, one more, one more thing we can plug in for. Um, X and Y themselves, don't forget, are given in the parameterization. Let's see, I'll use uh, orange for X. X, you see, is T. So X is T. in uh, all of these. And then uh, likewise, I'm gonna use yellow for Y. Y is T squared. So, okay, Y is T squared. Y is T squared. Just uh, plugging in. So again, a couple of specifics are different. Um, the uh, uh, center of, I'm just to clean up my mess here. The center of mass calculation, um, there's, an, there's a factor of X in there that there isn't, <clears throat> in uh, some of the other calculations. So yeah, that part's different, right? And uh, the um, uh, Y coordinate, uh, there's a Y in there, Y being T squared, that's uh, not in the others because, well, you know, again, this, the particulars of that particular uh, thing that we're computing. Um, and uh, likewise for some of the others. But uh, by and large, it's the same kind of, it's the same strategy for computation for all four of these calculations. How are we doing? Is everybody happy? Okay. All right, here's another example. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a, a fence. Uh, the fence is sitting uh, on top of the unit circle. So uh, maybe, you're, maybe you've got a, a garden uh, in your backyard or something like that. Um, or maybe you just have a weird shaped plot of land that you want to put a fence around. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, you want to build a fence. Uh, fine. How much area is there on the fence? Well, it's the height of the fence times the length of the fence, right? Area is height times length. It's not, it's easy, right? But what if your height is not constant? Right? So uh, we're going to have to do a chop it up, add it up. Well, we're going to uh, uh, take our, our curve here. Let's see here. I take our curve. And I'm going to chop it up into little pieces. You can see here, you can see the fence. Here's my little pieces of fence. And uh, how much area is there in that fence? Well, it's the height of the fence at that location times the uh, length of that little piece of fence. And you can see that right here in the very first step we do in the calculation. Uh, area is uh, the height times the differential length. So just chop it up, add it up, right? It's uh, it's really a lot, I mean, if, certain point of view, it's a lot like the way we computed area in single variable calculus classes. It's just that now this is a line integral uh, instead of a uh, single variable integral because our domain, you know, where this fence sits is a curve in, in, uh, in, the, in the plane as opposed to an interval on the x-axis. Everybody good so far? Um, okay, so we've got ourselves a uh, line integral to compute here. How do we compute line integrals? Well, we parameterize. Um, how do we parameterize the unit circle? Well, that's our old friend, one of our early parameterizations, right? There's the parameterization of the unit circle. Um, why do I need the parameterization? Well, again, because the parameterization is what's ultimately going to lead to my stretching factor. And that's how we compute line integrals is with stretching factors. So uh, you take the derivative, you take the magnitude, and we've got ourselves a stretching factor. 
and it's all downhill from here. It's all plug and chug pretty much uh, from here. So um, uh, yeah, so uh, DS, let's see if I can get all this in. DS is speed times DT. We just computed the speed right here is one. Uh, notice we were given the, uh, let's see, the, the height as a function of location, x plus two over five. Uh, again, we find ourselves in the situation where if you, know, you look at uh, what we end up with here and we've got, a, there's an x in this formula. So uh, how am I gonna, uh, what's the deal with x? Where is x? Well, in the parameterization. So remember the parameterization is how you do pullbacks. So um, x is cosine t. And we have successfully pulled back. Notice we have now a single variable integral and y'all can uh, compute those. So. Pretty good. Okay, um, there, there is one uh, little bit of bad news I'm going to point out. I've, you know, um, selected these examples <laughs> carefully uh, in such a way that these magnitudes uh, turn out to be nice. Um, and of course, that doesn't always happen, right? I mean, uh, sometimes, in fact, often, one might even say generically, magnitudes are square roots. Right, and uh, don't probably, what are the odds? Probably don't simplify. And so these calculations, you know, the algebra, the ensuing, how do you actually turn the crank on the single variable integral? Uh, yeah, it's annoying sometimes. And uh, it, it, uh, it is what it is. Okay. All right, but that is ultimately a single variable calculus problem. Okay, all right, now here's a uh, kind of another example. I'm gonna present this as just another example. Suppose I want to compute work, right? So not area or mass or um, uh, uh, moment of inertia. Right? I want to compute work, um, you know, and, and specifically the amount of work that it takes to move along a, uh, a curve. And we have, it's again going to be a chop it up, add it up thing because the formula we have assumes that the force is constant and that the uh, that I'm displacing over a straight line segment. Uh, that's where this formula here came from anyway. Work is force not displacement makes those assumptions. So since that's not the case here, my, my uh, thing here is clearly not straight. Right, path, not straight. Um, the, uh, the force is not constant. Uh, because you can see, I mean, here's my force uh, and, you know, uh, over here, it looks like it's about like that, but over here, it's uh, totally different. So how do we deal? Well, it, chop it up, add it up, right? And the, the big picture strategy is to, uh, when, when things don't work out because stuff's not constant, <laughs> chop it up into little pieces and look at, you know, focus on the little bitty pieces. And on each little bitty piece, um, the piece is approximately straight. The force is approximately constant. Everything's, you know, we get exactly what we need in this uh, formula and we can just compute with the usual on each individual little piece one at a time. So great, chop it up, add it up. We'll end up with a line integral and off we go, right? It seems like everything's working out just great. Okay, is everybody good with me so far? Okay. All right. So, all right, um, th there is a little bit of a twist here. Uh, I am going to note that uh, if you're computing work, work depends on what we're going to call the orientation, uh, by which we mean just which direction are you going along this curve? Um, if this was a mountain road, which it actually kind of looks like, right? How much work it takes to move along that mountain road depends very heavily on are you walking up the mountain road or are you walking down the mountain road? Very different experiences. Um, so uh, when we say we want to compute this, uh, I'm going to have to indicate specifically which direction are we talking about. So I'm saying specifically that we're going this direction uh, along the uh, along the curve. 
And uh, that does lead, by the way, to a semantical question of how do I describe what I mean by that direction? I can't say, uh, yeah, we're going up because uh, which way is up, right? This curve here is sometimes going up, sometimes down, sometimes up again. I mean, it's not clear. Right. So typically, um, the uh, the way we describe the orientation is with uh, some sort of suggestive language, um, and uh, exactly how I would do it in this case, gosh, I don't know, that's, uh, <laughs> it'd be hard, but I would have the semantical task in front of me of describing what I mean by which way. Maybe I would label the endpoints and say, uh, you know, uh, starting at the purple point and uh, ending at the, at the red point, something like that. Okay. All right, but we need to describe an orientation. Um, our first clue that things are different in this example is this, the fact that ah, the, the question doesn't even really make sense unless I describe which way I'm going. That's not true of painting fences. It takes the same amount of paint to paint the fence, whether you start on this side and go that way or whether you start on this side and go that way, right? Um, how much mass is there on a on a bent wire? Who cares which way you add it up? It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. But with this next one, it does. And so again, eyebrow raised. Uh, something is a little different here. Everybody with me? Okay. Okay. So anyway, let's proceed. Uh, not worrying about that. We'll deal with it. Uh, problems as they arise. Um, here's a little piece of the curve. Uh, the way I understand that little piece of curve is by uh, looking at the position differential as my displacement. And uh, conveniently, the force, approximately constant over that curve, is what I dot with that position differential. Um, and now, again, because the curve is approximately straight and it's really tight, and the force is approximately constant, Mm. work is force times distance All right so the amount of work that it takes to move along this piece of curve here or you know i'll say it, the differential amount of work uh, is dw and uh, chop it up add it up and uh, the way we compute the total work by adding up all these little pieces of work these little pieces of work I have a formula for. We're, we're, we're kind of, we, we have a, uh, a, what I'm gonna call an answer. Uh, and, but here's where we have to recognize again, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look the same as uh, things that we've seen before. Um, this is not a, a uh, you know, density times DS kind of a line integral. So that's why we have the semantics of um, a scalar line integral such as if you're uh, chopping up and you know computing total amount of mass versus this new thing is now a vector line integral, what we call a vector line integral. Uh, and uh, let's see, where am I? Here it is. A um, couple different motivations you might take for why we call it a vector line integral. Notice the differential piece uh, of, uh, well, I'll say the, the, the the position differential, the differential that's describing what's happening on the piece of curve. It's a vector. It's not DS, it's not length, scalar quantities. This is a vector displacement because, that, because that's relevant in the calculation, right? You wanna compute work, I need to know which way are you going, right? Work is, a, is, a, is an orientation dependent thing. Uh, another argument for why we call this a vector line integral, I suppose, I think this one's, uh, anyway, um, the integrand, it's a vector, <laughs> right? So another really good motivation, perhaps, to call this a vector line integral. Okay, so um, it's just a different kind of integral. Uh, there's a bad news, good news situation here. The bad news is, oh, yet another new kind of an integral, Ugh, right? Good news. So what? It's chop it up, add it up. It's still a curve. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's going to turn out that we're going to be able to compute these things pretty much the same way we did with scalar line integrals. So this is actually nothing to sweat. It's not that big a deal. But nevertheless, vector line integral. Okay. 
Um, right. So how do we compute these things? Uh, remember, parameterizations are the foot in the door. Parameterizations are how you view undesirable domains. Right. This is still happening on a curve. That curve is still weird. Uh, parameterizations are how you view it as an image. Once you have it as an image, you can do a pullback. It, so that strategy is still the same. And furthermore, our formulas still pretty much all the same, right? I mean, what is dx? dx is x prime dt. Um, so, oh, in fact, why don't I leave that plugged in here? So looking at our vector line integral formula here, that dx, I'm just gonna plug in x prime dt and uh, now here's where I, at some point we're like, well, yeah, but what about a stretching factor or don't we have to do a stretching factor? Well, it's kind of built in to what we've got written down here. The stretching factor is part of that X prime. Magnitude of X prime is what, is what the stretching factor is. So uh, here you go. This is how you compute from a parameterization a line integral. A line integral being something that would, for example, compute work. How are we doing? Yes. Is that different from before when we said the integral of f of x of t times the magnitude of x prime of t? Well, yeah, it's just it's a little bit different because we're computing a different thing, right? I and mean, we found ourselves here. You know, here I was needing to figure out how to rewrite the dx vector, mm -hmm. um, and the dx vector. Okay, well, you know that previously we were not trying to compute the dx vector previously we were trying to compute uh the ds scalar um when you know when i'm looking at this oh i'm sorry say again is this one a scalar line integral yeah that's right so this this right here is a scalar line integral that's right uh so here you go that scalar line integral yeah, absolutely. Uh, scalar, because the differential describing the piece of curve, or what we need to know about the piece of curve, is a scalar quantity. Yeah, so size. So, so I mean, that's the kind of the tip off, you know, you know which one you're going to be using in a given application. The tip off is, well, what do you need to know about the piece of curve? If all you need to know about the piece of curve is how big is it, right? Such as, you know, uh, length so that I can multiply by mass per unit length to get mass, I don't really care which way it's oriented, then um, scalar line integrals, what you need. Um, here, for this work question, uh, we needed more than that. Here, in order to know work, I need to know not just how long the piece of curve is, but uh, what the displacement vector is. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, where am I? Uh, yeah, 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 here we go. Okay, so nice, happy answer, a little formula. By the way, something weird I think about this, uh, you know, there's a tendency for harder problems to have harder answers. And I feel like that didn't happen here. I feel like here, arguably, this is a harder problem because it's not just chop it up, add it up, but it's chop it up, add it up with an orientation and dot products to compute the, the differential quantity. And it uh, seems like it ought to be harder than the scalar version. And the, the, it actually ended up being easier in the sense that I don't have to compute a magnitude which uh, as previously noted, likely to give us square roots, which is likely to be a bummer. No magnitude, no, no square roots, no problem. It's the weird fact about vector line integrals, they tend to be easier to compute than scalar line integrals. So anyway, that's something to look forward to. <laughs> okay. All right, now I do want to comment on a different point of view that you can take on a uh, vector line integral. Again, vector line integral, here it is. Uh, and that is to point out that another way to rewrite dx is as the unit tangent vector t times ds. And uh, how, do I, how do I know that these two things are equal to each other? Uh, there's a real slick uh, sort of uh, uh, point of view you can take on this. Both of these expressions here, are equal to t 
times the magnitude of x prime uh, times uh, dt. And you can see that by observing that uh, that's dt, that's dt, and x prime is that vector. Right, this vector I have highlighted in green points in the direction of x prime. Its magnitude is the magnitude of x prime. It looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, so it's a duck. Right. So, so that, so that's how I know the the left side is is what I claim, uh, and then the right side, um, t is t, and as previously noted, ds is x prime magnitude of x prime times dt. So this one looks like a duck and quacks like a duck too. So, um, I know that these are equal to each other because they're both equal to the same thing. Does that make sense to everybody? I think it's a slick move. Nice little argument. Um, so some people like this notation um, here for dx, thus giving us uh, this alternative notation for the vector line integral. Um, <clears throat> one, one reason to like this is that check it out now we're, we're back to an integral ds it feels familiar it's like oh goody it's it's pretty much just uh, a, a scalar line integral again and that feels like good news but i remind you <laughs> uh it's not really right we've already noted that uh having to compute a magnitude is a pain why would i want to uh, turn a otherwise very simple to compute expression into something where I'm uh, going to have to compute a magnitude. In fact, you're going to have to compute the magnitude twice, arguably, because you have to divide x prime by its magnitude to get the t vector. <laughs> right? So anyway, I just think this notation here, most of the time, I don't see the point why one would want to write it like this uh, from a computational standpoint. I mean, there, there are some uh, some uh, I'm going to call coincidental situations where it is convenient. So it's, that's why I'm showing it to you. Uh, I, want, I want everybody to know this. And, and of course, you're going to see it in other contexts written like this. But I encourage you to, uh, to think mostly in terms of that's what a vector line integral fundamentally is. This is what connects to applications. This is also the one that requires the least pencil lead. That's got to count for something. Right. Um, and uh, this is the one that's most directly computationally useful. And uh, oh, yeah, um, then I, I guess, yeah, there's also this other notation, which uh, maybe it will make some sense at some point. All right, so let's do one. Um, we want to uh, uh, see how much work. Does it take to accomplish a certain task? In particular, uh, wind is uh, uh, blowing on me and exerting a force on me. And so look, if the wind is exerting a force on me, then I, I'm gonna have to push against the wind. And so it's gonna take me work to walk around this uh, path, the path being uh, the uh, top half of the unit circle. So we've got all the formulas we need. Uh, we know we're just gonna pretty much parameterize, et cetera, et cetera. There is a tricky little bit here though. This is a physics thing. Um, I wanna compute how much force, uh, excuse me, how much work I have to exert. Therefore, I need to know how much force I am pushing with. How much force am I pushing with? Am I pushing with this force? No, that's the force that the wind is exerting. The wind is exerting the force F. I am pushing opposite of the wind, right? I have to oppose the wind. So F that was given, and by the way, the, the, this is all wrapped up in the language of the way the question is written uh, and the way, you know, uh, so it says right there in the question, the F is the, is the force that the wind is exerting. It also says right there in the question, how much work do you um, uh, have to exert, right? And so you gotta recognize that language and identify this, that you need this minus sign. 
Does that make sense to everybody? All right, it's like I say, it's an annoying physics thing, but that, that's, that's where we're at. So anyway, so this minus sign here, uh, uh, we uh, put it into the expression. And now it's just a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, plugging and chugging pretty much. Oh, let's see, I scroll down too much. So we're looking at uh, the unit circle. Here's how we parameterize the unit circle. Again, our old friend, world's most familiar parameterization. Um, specifically though, it says the top half of the unit circle, top half of the unit circle, zero to pi. Yeah. Um, and off we go. Um, we know we're going to need uh, x prime, so we take the take the derivative, and it's all plug and chug from here. Um, there's our our vector line interval. Um, let's see here. Uh, dx is x prime dt. Um, I, again, it's plug and chug, but I do have to plug. And so uh, let's uh, be careful here. I'm going to zoom out. It looks like um, this. Oh, where's the force? Uh, here it is. F. Keep in mind, I've already got the minus sign in there, right? So I don't have to reinterpret, oh, I need a different F because I need the, the F for the, I'm, no, the minus signs accounted for. F is what I want. F is given Y comma negative X. So F, Y comma negative X there. Um, let's see here. Now I do have to plug in for what is Y and what, it, oh, I'm gonna do that. Uh, for what is Y and what is X. And uh, this Y right there, again, it comes from the parameterization. Always look to the parameterization for plugging in. Uh, y is sine T. Uh, what am I going to do about this X right there? Oh, well, again, look to the parameterization. X is cosine T. How are we doing? Um, yeah. So uh, now heads up about one thing. I'll tell you what uh, I think I, one, one of the biggest causes of mistakes that students make on exams on uh, working out problems like this is minus signs. It's really easy to, oh my gosh, there's so many minus signs running around. So, it, <laughs> so there's a, a uh, a very common mistake for students to make again is to try to do too much in their heads and accidentally forget one of these two minus signs, right? Uh, and then, of course, you get a wrong answer. Um, now, uh, I'll warn you against uh, the um, the other possibility is to accidentally forget two of them. And it's tempting to say, well, if you forget two minus signs, it's not a problem at all. Not so. Um, if you forget two minus signs and uh, therefore get the exact right answer, you still forgot two minus signs. Again, it's not a question of whether your answer is right. It's a question of whether your argument is valid. And a, an, an argument that is doubly wrong is still doubly wrong. <laughs> okay, so that, this, would, this would be, you know, if you forgot two minus signs, just, you know, again, just to be clear, um, that's uh, two little micro uh, deductions, uh, not zero. Okay, how are we doing? Is everybody, any questions about any of that? Is everybody on board? Yes. I guess like what, what happens if like, like conceptually, like if like the vector is, if the force vector is like perpendicular, then like the cross product, then it's like yep. zero. It, that's right. And, th and that jives with reality because um, let's, let's think about, uh, you know, suppose I was gonna walk on a perfectly horizontal road. Let's so not forget about wind, yeah. right? But perfectly horizontal road. <laughs> Suppose I'm gonna walk from here over to the door. How much work does it take me to perform that task? Well, I could be inefficient about it and let my center of mass bounce up and down. My muscles have to lift, et cetera. But if I was smart, I'd put on a pair of rollerblades and just kind of gently push against the wall and you know, just roll right over there and it takes no work. And it, so it's no work. And it's exactly for the reason that you described. It's because my displacement is that way, and the force that I'm exerting is that way. 
okay. right? And that dot product is zero. Right. So it literally is no work. Right. Yeah. Um, there are some tougher questions about the physics interpretation of this, uh, such as uh, what does it mean to be negative work? Right. Um, and negative work actually is uh, is is uh, it is weird. It's a weird idea. Right. But there's a real world natural and I think really super cool example of negative work being performed. And that is um, uh, what they call regenerative braking in uh, hybrid cars or uh, you know electric cars. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, there's a there's some physics that we don't really have to, at our disposal at the moment. But um, if a car with regenerative braking is at top at top of a hill and is going down the hill, um, rather than use friction, right, to which is how brake pads work, right, rather than use friction to turn all of that potential energy as it goes down the hill into heat, um, regenerative braking uses a, uh, an electrical circuit, very clever electrical circuit thing to turn that potential energy into battery energy. And you will literally charge your battery as you go downhill uh, in uh, one, of those, uh, one of those kinds of cars. So yeah, so negative work is uh, um, just saying, yeah, you'll recharge your battery if you do this. Yeah. Great question, anybody else? Does that make yes? Yeah, two quick things. So with that rollerblade example, yeah. why would the force you're exerting be down? Because yeah, because I because I don't want to fall down. And the way I the way I make sure that I don't fall is by pushing with my legs, I push down. Oh, I guess you could say gravity's pulling me down and I'm pushing up. I mean, okay, yeah, I'm pushing down with my legs, but I'm but the result is to push me up. But it's still the point is it's still perpendicular. Don't you need like a force to get you started? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and, you're already going. Yeah, and then so we we could say that yeah, I do have to do a little bit of work when I push off here. That's a little bit of work, but that gives me some velocity, which then when I get to the door, I can use my regenerative braking if I had such right, and and regain all of that when I get there. Um, so uh, ultimately, it's just uh, 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 force dot displacement. Yeah. In other words, the things that you can't clever your way out of, there is no way to clever your way out of this. Elon Musk will never figure out a way to, <laughs> right? To, uh, yeah, work just goes away. No, this is, that's real. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody happy? All righty. Um, Let's see where we're yeah okay right so uh we've got this integral again the parameterization tells us what x oh we already did that x and y um so we're down to here and notice this is a it's a single variable integral all expected t's notice further i don't need to compute the magnitude of this thing right um not that that would be hard in this case but certainly could be in other cases um and uh gotta love vector line integrals in that sense no magnitudes to, to deal with and single variable integral and uh, easy to compute. Everybody happy? All right, now um, <clears throat> let me scroll back. Um, if I wanna compute the amount of area of a fence, does it matter how I parameterize, right? I could parameterize this curve to move twice as fast around. Does that change the area of the fence? No, that's, of course not. It's the fence is a fence. If I uh, am computing, you know, the, the mass on this thing here, right? I've got this, um, I've got this, this curve here. And if I want to compute the mass, what if I run twice as fast along the, or move twice as fast along the wire? Does that make it way more? No, of course not, that's silly. Um, so I'm going to come down to, yeah, here we go. Um, so if you have a line integral, it doesn't depend on the parameterization. True for scalar line integrals. All right, parameterize any which way you want. Who cares? Doesn't matter. You can parameterize faster or slower or knock yourself out. Um, so it, uh, the, the, the reason, I mean, the sort of the, the intuition for why 
that is the case is that well that's all just that's just a computational aspect of things it doesn't change the fundamental quantity so it's tempting to say that it's also true for vector line integrals that doesn't matter how you parameterize parameterize any way you want um and uh, uh asterisk uh <laughs> there is actually an issue there and that is you do have to interpret uh, what we mean by a vector line integral uh, carefully. Um, for, for whatever it's worth, um, I, I, the book did a very nice job of treating this very carefully. For the purposes of Math 219, too careful. Um, so I don't want y'all to get bogged down in the, all the, the formalities and uh, they, they prove a bunch of things that um, we're, we're not gonna uh, bother with uh, proving it's a uh, rigor uh, beyond uh, what's appropriate to this course so nevertheless though there is a uh, a key point here that is not a, just a point of rigor this is a you're going to get wildly wrong answers and your bridge is going to fall down if you uh if you're not uh, up to this point and that is you do have to parameterize the correct direction that the curve is going now i deliberately swept this under the rug with the last examples uh, because, uh, you know, I wanted to get our get one under our belt. Let's get our fingers dirty and, uh, uh, you know, actually compute one. But uh, I uh, got lucky in that calculation because I just happened to parameterize the correct direction. Let me show you what I mean. Go back to, uh, well, let's see here. Uh, this is my first example. Yeah. Okay. Um. I didn't even draw attention to it as I did it, but it does say right here in the question, counterclockwise. And we've already observed it definitely matters. If you're gonna compute work, it absolutely matters which way you're going, right? Downhill is easy, uphill is hard. Well, the question said counterclockwise and I gave zero attention, again, on purpose, right? Um, zero attention to whether or not we parameterize the correct direction. And it just happens to be that we did, we got it right. Now, uh, how's that gonna work for y'all? Uh, it's a coin flip. When you parameterize something, unless you are actively, consciously thinking about the direction that you're parameterizing, 50-50, you're gonna parameterize it the wrong way. All right, so this is important. Again, it's gonna give you an answer that's off by a minus sign which is, uh, you know, when it comes to building bridges, uh, kind of a big deal. Okay, so you gotta uh, think about that. Um, uh, in, in particular, if you parameterize the wrong way, all of your position differentials are backwards, right? Instead of a position differential like this, you'll have a, your position differential will be, I mean, in some sense, kind of right, <laughs> right? But uh, going the wrong way, it's so it'll be the negative of what it should be. So um, everything, all of your position differentials, they're all off by a factor of minus one. Um, and of course, this is a bad news, good news thing. If all of your terms are off by a factor of minus one, well, then your answer is just gonna be off by a factor of minus one. So um, this, uh, this uh, theorem here basically says exactly that. Um, I noticed that I do make a definition of what we mean by um, putting a minus sign in the exponent of, a, of the name of a curve. It's just notation to represent same curve, go in the opposite direction. And uh, roughly speaking, what this theorem says is that if you change orientations, you're just gonna get a minus sign or said differently if you if you have the wrong orientation uh you will uh you will get the you will get just a minus yes so like on an exam if after working it out with the line exactly just like write that theorem like that instead of yeah absolutely now you, but you do have to document and say bummer i parameterize this backwards right um therefore and and then but then you know you'd want to yeah, what, what I wanna make sure students don't do is the following. 
Uh, there's a tendency to do things like, you know, you're computing along and you have some expression. Uh, and then here's where you realize, whoops, I forgot my minus sign. And then you just kind of insert a minus sign like that. This is not good if you insert, you know, just insert a minus sign because this student is claiming that that thing is equal to its own negative. That's just not true, right? So you can uh, insert the minus sign uh, everywhere, you know, back through the whole thing, uh, or maybe easier, you can just, you know, leave it wrong and then draw a line and say, uh, you know, uh, orientation, my bad. Uh, and so uh, you're, you know, and then, you know, answer equals and then just put the right answer. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. Okay. All right. So the, the ideal is to parameterize the right way. <laughs> Um, but again, because it's hard to know sometimes which way you're parameterizing, if you get it the wrong way, just uh, fix it. Okay, so um, let's uh, revisit the same question previous. Um, here's this curve. Um, but let's ask the question, what if we're walking instead of counterclockwise, right? The last example we did was uh, counterclockwise. What if we're walking clockwise? So I'm going to show you three different ways to answer this question. Uh, the first two, we're going to parameterize correctly. <clears throat> um, how do I parameterize that curve? Yeah, again, there's a couple different ways to think about this. Um, I, the most direct way to think about it, I think, um, is to recognize that, well, okay, that means that uh, position is a function of time and, you know, T goes from, you know, wherever to wherever, but as T increases, uh, that's the angle that's increasing. So I'm going to call that angle T. Calling that angle T makes my parameterization go the correct direction. Uh, uh, that means then that this angle is pi minus T. That is the angle with which I can do trig. Right, and say that position is a cosine of that angle, sine of that angle. Right, so you just got to real. I mean, it's a little bit annoying, but there's two angles that matter. One that is ultimately controlling the direction that our parameterization is going, the green angle. The blue angle is the one that allows me to use trig and actually write that down in algebra. Everybody okay with that? Um, at which point, by the way, uh, you know, do, do make sure to remember your trig, uh, you know, angle addition formulas uh, get uh, poo-pooed far too much in high school trig classes. Um, they are <laughs> surprisingly important on a semi-regular basis, as it turns out. Um, or um, sometimes, if you want to take a different point of view, uh, the symmetries of sine and cosine unavoidably really important sometimes. So um, anyway... Make sure you're good with trig. Now, here's a second way to parameterize. Second way to parameterize is to say, well, look, this path I'm trying to parameterize is a reflection over this line of this path that I already know how to parameterize. Right? So the green path, cosine t, sine t, just literally reflect it over the blue y-axis there. And that reflection is what gives you that minus sign there. Minus sign on the x-coordinate. So uh, take your pick. I mean, I, I think it's a good idea to be proficient with both of these tools because it's, again, best to have tools in your toolbox. And these are both really good tools for your toolbox. Um, but uh, either either one works. And uh, with that parameterized and uh, yada, 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 you can go ahead and compute and you will get as your answer, negative pi. Um, the third way to answer this question is what we were talking about before. Oh, same curve, just going the opposite orientation. Okay, well, minus sign. The previous one was pi. Therefore, this one's negative pi. Right, so, so um, as, as you were asking, yeah, feel free to just parameterize it backwards and, and then, you know, 
make make sure you fix it at the end and say, oh, uh, uh, I got the opposite orientation. And that opposite orientation gives me gives me this minus sign. Everybody good? Okay. Okay, all right, uh, this is a pretty good stopping point and we're out of time. So uh, drawing a line right there. See y'all on Wednesday. Um, have a good one. Oh yeah, give me a second to um, to get this turned off and then I'll, I'll uh, yeah, let's see here.